Well, again, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. We are so blessed to be able to continue our study through God's Word. And if you have your Bibles, would you please open up to 1 Peter chapter 4. If you're just joining us this morning for the first time, we are going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book uh, through the New Testament currently. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning. Now, many of you have asked about what translation of the Bible we typically teach from. I typically will teach from the New King James Version, just so that you know. Uh, And if I reference or share a cross-reference that isn't from the New King James Version, uh, I will let you know which version it is. So uh, just so that you know as you're following along. But in our last study, we left off with Peter's encouragement that suffering for the Lord or for your stand for righteousness is pleasing to God. And the difficulty that you endure well, if you endure your hardships well, will bring about a massive amount of blessings from the Lord. And so this is part two in our series entitled A Suffering That Overcomes, as we're going to be looking at in detail how suffering in our sinful nature, suffering in our flesh will produce great things spiritually. And the Lord will use the difficulties that you endure and the things that you struggle with and have to wrestle with in order to produce great things in your life. If you would look back at chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 12, and we're going to read from the New Living Translation. It says, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil, verse 9, 1 Peter 3. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, verse 12, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 4, since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Let's pray. Father, we ask now as we get into your word, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. Lord, there are not one of us here today that have not suffered in some capacity. There are many that may be currently suffering. Lord, we ask that you would please minister to your people in a very personal way today. I ask, Lord, that as this message is taken straight from your Holy Scriptures, that it would be tailor-made by your Holy Spirit for those that would hear it. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to each one according to your perfect knowledge of their needs. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless our church today. And, Lord, as we even look around the world and see the things that are happening, Lord, there are such great signs, Lord, of your second coming, coming to a very, very approaching. Lord, we know that you're coming quickly. Lord, we know, God, that you want us to be ready. Lord, that we can't be messing around with the things of the world. You're coming soon. Lord, we see what's happening with the different governments around the world. We see what's happening with Israel. Lord, we know, God, that you are moving, and in spite of all the turmoil and chaos in this world and even in our own country, Lord, we know that you're still on the throne. And so, Lord, we pray over what's happening in Israel. We pray over what's happening in the United States. We pray over what's happening around the world. We ask that you would work all things together, Lord, for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And Lord, as we know, God, that your scriptures say that these things will happen before you return again, I pray that we would not be ignorant, Lord, that we would listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that we would read your word, and that we would be able to view life with a biblical lens, Lord, so that we wouldn't be caught off guard when false doctrine may come across our path, may opposing, when opposing worldviews, Lord, hit us head on. 
I pray that we would be able to stand firmly on the foundation of your truth. Jesus, your word is truth. And so, Lord, we ask, God, that you would add your blessing now to the reading and to the study of your word. Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. And Lord, I pray that we would not have any blinders on. Lord, if we're not able to see things in our blind spot, would you broaden our vision? Would you give us greater understanding? And Lord, may we see that we are a part of a great plan that is more than just us, Lord, more than just our family, even more than just our church. Lord, you are working around the world today as you do every day. And we ask, God, that you would help us to be so in tune with you that we would be able to be used by you in a great way. And so, Lord, as we look to your word, as we look at what suffering produces in our lives, Lord, and the decisions that we need to make to either follow after the ways of the world or to pursue holiness, I pray that you would give us the strength, Lord, to do what you called us to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And it says in verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So really, since Jesus did all of this, as we read from 1 Peter chapter 3, as he set the example, if you're to be his follower, you should follow his example. Christ-like is the word that we want to apply, or the words that we want to apply to our life. Christian means Christ-like. It doesn't mean born in the United States of America. Christian doesn't mean I went to Sunday school. Christian doesn't mean my grandma was a Christian. See, A Christian means I am like Christ. I follow his example. I share his view on life. And this is very important because there is this move across the United States that has dumbed down Christians in church. Where we're no longer the salt and light of the world, but we have become like the world. We're no longer like Jesus. Ironically, we're saying I'm Christ-like, but I'm not Christ-like in the way that I think. I'm not Christ-like in the way that I speak. I'm not Christ-like in the way that I live. I'm not Christ-like in the way that I endure difficulties. And so that has to change. And so we should all be challenged today to be able to be in a place that we know that I'm not just saying, but I'm also doing. Because it's unfortunate when a Christian will acknowledge Jesus' example, but fail to follow it. And we miss out on so many blessings from the Lord when we do so because we can hear the truths of God's word. We might even acknowledge them to be true. But we never apply them to our life. And so Peter is saying that Jesus is not only an example, but he is the example of how to know what the right thing is to do. Because nowadays, everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes. Every man is doing what is right in their own eyes. That's why we have people that say, hey, speak your truth. Live your truth. Do what's right for you. Who am I to tell you any other, uh, anything different than what you believe? So we must know as a follower of Jesus that the right thing to do, and the right thing to do is found in God's word. It's found in following Jesus' example. And so since Jesus suffered in his physical body... As he endured those hardships, there was an overwhelmingly better outcome. What his death brought to the world was forgiveness of sins. And he endured this hardship. He endured this difficulty. And look at the great things that came from that. We are living proof of the great work of God. Jesus' death on the cross meant forgiveness of sins. His resurrection from the dead meant newness of life, salvation. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was chastised for our peace. And we fail to realize that when we're persecuted or when we endure hardship, there is such a great work of God that is taking place in your life. As he takes you to those deep places of knowing him in ways that you never thought were possible. Yet, we love hearing the stories of God's faithfulness in other people's lives. We love hearing the stories of people of great faith. Wow. Man, that that must have been so difficult. You are are an amazing person. You endured all of those things. What a a tremendous story of God doing the miraculous. I, I could never have believed that unless I would have heard it from your lips that you had experienced that personally. And then maybe even under a whim, we think to ourselves, "Uh, you know, I like to have my own stories of faith. But when the opportunity arises, when you're in that position where you need to trust in God, do 
Do you try to get out of it as fast as you possibly can? Or can you be like a, or maybe you're like a train wreck where you're trying to do things in your own strength instead of relying upon the Lord because I don't like that feeling of having to trust in God. I don't like that feeling of having to have faith. I wish I could just be a great man or woman of faith without ever having to use my faith. And then we wonder why we fail or why we don't grow or why we have to keep taking the same test over and over again. Man, I like to take a test once and be done with it. I don't want to take it again. And I've had to take tests over and over and over again in my life. And sometimes you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you're like, I'm not failing this test again. Come on. I just graduated to ninth grade and I'm 35 years old. Can I please like move on with my life? Can I just pass the test? See, Satan wants us stuck in a rut where there's no spiritual fruit being produced in our lives. Where we become complacent, we become apathetic, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever, man. I don't even care anymore. And then we become inefficient. Because we think that it's all about what we bring to the table or all about what I can do to save myself when really the truth is is that we are insufficient of ourselves as to think of anything as being from ourselves. Our sufficiency is from God. And it takes us getting to that point where our physical being or our mental state or our emotional state suffers for us to realize that I need something more than what I can provide for myself. And see, the Lord will allow us to go through these times where he'll say, well, if you would like to handle that yourself, you have the freedom to do so. I don't recommend you doing that, but you are free to make that decision. Or you can say, Lord, I submit myself to your perfect work in my life, and Lord, I need your help, Lord. I need your wisdom. You know, because when things get uncomfortable, I want to get out of that as fast as I possibly can. When I'm feeling something I don't like, I, I, I want it to be gone as fast as I possibly can get it gone out of my life. I wonder what you'll discover today about yourself from hearing these things. That Christ, having suffered for us in the flesh, that we are to arm ourselves with that same mind. For he who has suffered in his flesh has ceased from sin. In verse 1 of 1 Peter 4, we're told to follow Jesus' lead, to arm ourselves with the same mind of Christ. Listen, all of us here today, if you look around, we have a large group of people all going through something. You're all going through something. We all have something happening in our lives that maybe is not very pleasant, that is difficult, that's on our mind. Maybe we came in heavy-hearted today. Some of us are still in the fight Others may have thrown in the towel. I wonder where you're at today. Because you know that Satan's right there in your ear saying, yeah, what good is it to follow Jesus? What good is it to do what's right? Look how you're suffering. Look at all the difficulties that are heaped upon your head. You know, I remember years and years ago in my early days at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, it was a difficult time that I was going through. I wasn't married. I was a single man. I'm working 60 plus hours a week. I'm having all kinds of new experiences with demon-possessed people and teaching Bible studies and missions work, and it was overwhelming. And I just felt like every day I was under this heavy, heavy spiritual warfare. And I remember having this thought pop in my head that was strictly, I believe it was a fiery dart, strictly from the devil, where it made me feel that if I would just lay off the gas pedal for Christ, so to speak, if I would just tone it down a little bit, if I would just go and do something else with my life other than being in ministry, that all of these problems would go away. That Satan would take it easy on me if I would just stop being so hardcore for the Lord. And I thought, that sounds really nice, actually. You know, when you're going through the heat of things, you're just like, you know what, I don't even know if I want to deal with this anymore. And you know Satan's right there saying, yeah, that's the spirit. Quit doing what God's called you to do. But see, Satan is a liar. He's the father of it. When he speaks lies, he speaks from his own resources. Jesus said, and if Satan wants to lure you out of the center of God's perfect will, it's not so that he can take it easy on you. It's so that he can destroy you. See, no matter how difficult life may be, you want to be in the center of God's perfect will. That's where you want to be. Do you feel past the point of no return? Do you feel or have you been led to believe that your situation is just too large for God? What are you arming yourself with for your spiritual battle today? 
See, enduring difficulty is what you are called to do. And you will never, ever reach your full potential in Christ until you're willing to be stretched beyond what you're able to be stretched with. You need to be able to get to that point in your life where you're saying, this is beyond me. I can't do this, Lord. And right there, right there, it kicks in. Where the Lord speaks to you and says, I'm going to call you to do something that you cannot do for yourself. I'm asking you to be yielded to my Holy Spirit in such a way that you do not have what it takes to get to the other side. I remember when Jesus told his disciples when that great number of people with the thousands of men and women and the children and they were out and it was late and there was no food and Jesus told his disciples, you give them something to eat. He already knew what he was going to do. He was going to break the loaves and the fish and he was going to feed the multitudes but he told his disciples, I'm asking you to do something that you can't do for yourself. You can only do it through me. And see, when we endure suffering, And you think, man, this is greater than I can bear. This is too much. That's when the Lord begins to work in your life something extremely rare and special. And if we can't endure hardships, church, follower of Jesus, if we're unwilling to sacrifice the things of our sinful nature, then we will find that we will lose the battle every single day time. That which costs the most and requires the most is the very knife, it would seem, that cuts away those things that are not important and will slow you down. And see, the word of God at work in your life is steadily removing the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The word of God as you pour it into your life, as you read it, as you digest it, as you take it in, as you search the scriptures, as it transforms your mind, as it changes your heart, you will find that your priorities that would seek to usurp the place of God in your life are removed. And only he who belongs on the throne of your life remains. Now listen, no one signs up to follow Jesus so that they can endure hardships. Hey, we, we, we would like you to follow Jesus so you can have a really hard life. You don't get very many sign-ups at those kind of events. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, to his followers, to those that are Christ-like, He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. That's your sinful desires, your selfish wants and needs. He says, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus is speaking of a lifestyle, of denying your own will, but it's not without example. Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, make it possible, make it happen, but nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will. battle by following Jesus' example and determining in your mind to subject all things to the lordship of Jesus in your life. All things under the lordship of Christ. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. He says, for though we walk in our physical nature, we do not war according to the physical nature. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts. We live in a physical world, but we also fail to realize that there is a spiritual realm that is behind the physical world. And you might be experiencing a trial in the physical realm, but get this, it was birthed in the spiritual realm. The things we're seeing around the world, the things we're seeing with governments and presidents and dictators and emperors and and terrorists and leaders and all these things that we're seeing, The principalities and powers and regions, these all have spiritual beings behind them. And Satan wants you as the church to fight the physical with the physical so he can win. But the wise man or woman of faith fights 
physical battles on their knees. And you're all able to overcome all things through suffering for a little while, if need be. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.7, it says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Throughout history, there has never been, nor will there ever be, a church or an individual follower of Jesus who has faced persecutions, tribulation, difficulty, or pain that has not come through purified and powered for holy living. If the Lord has you walking through the fire, you will not come out less like Christ. You may not like it. You might wrestle with it. You might be doubting your faith, doubting the promises of God, but the Lord is patient and he walks with you through those things and then your sinful nature begins to be melted away. Only that which remains is that which glorifies God. And if you've suffered because of your relationship with the Lord, then blessed are you. You've partaken now in the sufferings of the Lord and the Lord will sustain you and the Lord will bring you out of that suffering in the most marvelous way. That's the reason you can't quit. You cannot quit today. God knows all things, sees all things, hears all things, and you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And he is with you even during your trials. And there is a suffering that overcomes the lusts of the flesh. Look at the end of verse 1 where he says, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If you're taking notes, just jot down, just jot down these two words, suffering and ceasing. Suffering and ceasing. Suffering in your sinful nature does wonders for your spiritual nature. Wonders. And maybe there are some of you here today who have gone. Drain upon your relationship. Maybe quite possibly you are at the end of your relationship. You're about to break because of the difficulty you are enduring. And after going through such things over and over and over with those closest to you, guess what you end up discovering? You find that a very strengthened relationship exists. Look at what we've endured. Look at what we've gone through together. Look at what we thought was going to be the end of us and it actually was used by God to make us stronger than we ever were before. And see, the foxholes of life bring such a tremendous bond between warriors fighting in the spiritual realm side by side. And I'm sure that there are those among us today that have gone through things that they thought would destroy them, that would be the end of them. See, when Peter writes that he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin and is like Christ, that is something that we need to take ownership of in our own lives. But see, we don't want our flesh to suffer. Because I don't like that. I don't want to deny the lusts of my flesh. Suffering and enduring hardships is not something we typically like to do. I mean, some of you may be suffering sitting through a church service today. Well done, good and faithful servant. Keep pushing through. And see, the reality is, is if we deny our flesh, our flesh becomes very angry. You start to say no to your sinful appetites and it gets mad. You're not feeding it and you're starving the lusts of the flesh. You used to indulge it and you used to give in to it and you kept it nice and healthy in your life, but now you're not indulging it any longer. And it's quite sobering, isn't it, to recognize that there are so many layers of our sinful nature that we're not even aware of until suffering takes place. The heat gets turned up just to the right temperature in our lives, and then all of a sudden, all of these things start coming out. I didn't know I felt that way. I didn't know you felt that way. Why am I thinking this? Why am I feeling this? Why am I so agitated? Why do I feel like if I just give in to the lust of the flesh that this feeling will go away? 
But see, once the Holy Spirit puts his finger upon an area man. When the Holy Spirit shows us, shows me, shows you an area of your life that needs to change, and he says, this is you right here, all of a sudden you start sweating. You get a little hot under the collar. You start feeling a little squirmy, and you're like, wait a second, I don't know if I really like this. I think God's actually showing me an area in my life that needs to change. I thought I was comfortable where, was, where, where I was at. And now all of a sudden, there is the Holy Spirit's heavy hand upon your life. And he's saying, this is your area of sin, and you need to repent of it. You need to change. But I don't like that feeling. I want it to stop. And yet we see then so clearly the war that it's, that's taking place between my spiritual man and my sinful nature. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. And if you're denying your sinful appetites, if you're resisting temptation, if you're not giving in to sin, what an amazing feeling that is. To look back on the last half hour or the last day or the last week or the last whatever period of time it's been and to say, you know what? I haven't given in to that sin. Isn't that those, just the most amazing feeling ever? When you're going through it and you're saying, no, I'm not going to go give in to sin. I'm not going to lose my temper or I'm not going to go down that path or whatever it is. And it's almost like when you're trying to deny yourself some you know, food that you don't want to eat. You know, it didn't really bother you while it was there, but the moment you said, no, I'm not going to eat that, all of a sudden it's crying out to you from the pantry. Isn't it true? The moment you say, I'm not going to do something, it gains power. You can't say you're not going to do that to me. Of course you will. I've been with you for a very long time, and we've had a very close relationship for a very long time, and now you want to cut it off? Sin doesn't want just one area of your life. It wants all of your life. And the moment you decide, no, uh uh-uh, no way, I'm not doing this anymore, how dare you try to do that to me? How dare you try to cut me off? That's why Peter writes, arm yourself with the mind of Christ, for he who has suffered in his flesh has ceased from sin. It is okay for a Christian to suffer in his flesh. Your sinful nature should be crucified with Christ, as Paul said. Look at verse 2, that you should no longer live the rest of your life or this time in your human body. For the lusts of men, for the will of God, but for the will of God. Don't live the rest of your life after the lusts of the flesh, but for the will of God. And he says in verse 3, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, which means the world, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. We're reminded of the fact that we are to deny ourselves when we are presented with an opportunity to feed the sinful nature. And see, this happens all the time. There are opportunities to give in to the lusts of the flesh all the time. You know, in the church, we kind of have these phrases, and for people outside the church, they are like, what does that even mean? But inside the church, there's a certain phrase that's used, it's called my B.C. days. My B.C. days. And yes, B.C. refers to before Christ. You know, all those things I did back in the day, well, uh, those were my B.C. days. Things before I came to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. But Can I just ask you this question, generally speaking? How can your former life be your former life if it's your current life? How can you say those are my before Christ days when that's your current way of living? See, before our faith in Christ, we lived according to the lusts of our sinful nature. That's just the way that it goes. You're born with a sinful nature. You don't have to be taught to sin. We all do it perfectly well. We give in to the lust of the flesh. There's no qualms about it. We felt it. We did it. Made us happy. And that's what we do. But 
When we had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and met Jesus through faith, our lives changed. We repented of our sin, which means I went in the opposite direction. We asked for forgiveness for that sin. We were filled with the Holy Spirit. But some, maybe you, have gotten sucked back into the old ways of living before you met Jesus. You've backslidden. And so Peter encourages the church that you should no longer live your life for your sinful nature, for the lusts of men. What about all your old friends? What about all your old hangout spots? What about all the old ways of doing the old things? And therein lies the fundamental struggle with sin. It's your former connection to it. Fact. When you come to Jesus and put your faith in him, he saves you from your sin. Yet... In your mind and in your emotions, you may still have the scars of your former life before Christ. You may be reminded of certain things that were awful in your past, but now you view them with rose-colored glasses because you've forgotten the pain that was associated with that lifestyle that is against God or that choice to give in to the lust of the flesh. I mean, all you got to do is look at commercials today. Let's take alcohol commercials, for example. I mean, they look so amazing. You know, you see them all the time, and you got the DJ, you got the celebrities, you got the good-looking party people everywhere. Man, it's amazing. But have you ever walked into a bathroom where somebody is vomiting because they drank too much? Or maybe they didn't have time to make it to the bathroom, and now you know what it was that you stepped in on your way to the restroom? They never show the side effects. Sin is not going to mark it to you its outcome. It is the pleasure, the momentary pleasure that it wants to present to you as if this is what you need. This is what you want. They never show the damage that's done by drinking than driving or the types of things that you do because you've lost your inhibitions or maybe the bad, precarious situation that you find yourself in because you're inebriated or the long-term addictions that follow behind. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now this might be a word for some of you here today that some of you cannot say goodbye to your sinful lifestyle because you can't say goodbye to your old friends. Don't believe the lie. Don't be deceived into believing that you're the, ex- you're the exception to the rule that bad company corrupts good habits. Don't believe the lie that you're the exception to the rule that if you continue associating with those that are in sinful lifestyles and partaking in what they're doing and, and surrounding yourself with them, that it's not going to bring bad things out of your life. And then you'll discover real quickly, real quickly, I mean, I'm almost amazed at how quickly this happens. You will discover very quickly who your true friends are when you stop doing the same things that they're doing. When you're not doing the same sinful things that they're doing anymore, you will now discover who your true friends are. Look at verse 4. Peter writes and says, In regard to these, they think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation. They think it's strange that you're not doing the same things that you used to do with them. And it says they speak evil of you. And then you might be asking the question, I thought you were my friend. But the moment you decided to follow Jesus, you left the path of destruction and you started traveling the path of life. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. See, when you decide, when you decide to stop wasting your life, there are those that are still wasting their lives that are going to have a problem with you. Peter even goes as far to say that they'll speak evil of you. So don't be surprised if those who you thought were your friends were only your friends as long as you were doing the same thing. 
And this can be a very painful experience to have. And also, I think it's important to note, this doesn't mean that you stop caring about your old life friends now that you're a Christian. Rather, you should care for them more by praying for them, by inviting them to church, sharing the gospel with them, and being a good example, not just continuing to do the same things that your non-Christian friends are doing. And if you do have the opportunity to connect with them, I would suggest meet in a neutral spot. Meaning don't go head out to the bar to catch up. Don't get up in the club to see how they're doing. Go grab a coffee or go hang out someplace that wouldn't put you in a compromised position. And maybe then you can have a good conversation as a good friend. But don't be surprised if you're now at a crossroads where you're saying, you know, my friends are going this direction and Jesus is calling me to go that direction. Can I maintain the tension between both those things? And the answer is no. You can't serve two masters, Jesus said. But see, in the church today, we love being able to find that middle area. Where can I go and indulge the flesh and then still have a relationship with God? You're a miserable person at that point. Because you have too much of the Lord to truly enjoy the things of the world because you're convicted and you're having to override the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your conscience. But then as you try to grow in your walk with the Lord, you're wondering, why why do I feel so stunted? And why is there no spiritual fruit coming out of my life? Because you have too much of the world in you. So that's why Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And even if there are those that want to speak evil of you and make fun of you or you're some kind of Jesus freak or you're some kind of narrow-minded, bigoted or whatever the, you know, common phrases of the day, especially now there's a lot of them. But it says in verse 5 that they'll give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You will be made fun of. You will be. Why would you want to stand up for those that have no one to stand up for them? Why would you want to help those people when they have done nothing to help you? There are a lot of things that Jesus calls us to do that require us to die to ourself. But then through that, he uses those things in amazing ways. And you know, the disciples, when they were persecuted for preaching the gospel, they received that as a badge of honor. They were normal people just like you and me. They didn't wake up saying, I hope everybody hates me today and I get persecuted for my faith. No, but when it came down to whether they were going to obey man or obey God, they chose to obey God. When it came down to whether they were going to please man or please God, they chose to please God. And whatever happened after that, they committed it to the Lord. And the Lord honored those that honored him. All men will give an account All men will give an account. And there is an urgency for those that are saved to share with those that are not. And that's why we encourage you, invite your friends, invite your family to church. Share with them the good news of the gospel. See, what Jesus did, and we touched on this last week at the end of our our study, but what Jesus did in preaching to the spirits in Abraham's bosom, this wasn't a second chance type of thing, but rather a completion of their righteousness Through faith in God. Additionally, though, there are those that are dead in their trespasses and in their sins that can be made alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And your friends, be they new or old, will watch your faith as you endure trials. I mean, even the most small, minute, painful type of situation is watched by those that are not Christians. You go into your staff kitchen and hit your head on the cupboard, they watch. What words come out of your mouth? Oh, I thought you were a Christian. 
You endure big difficulties. They're watching. Man, he got bitter. Listen to him. He's just cussing all over the place. He's angry. He's snapping at people. He's treating people terribly. What kind of Christianity is that? They watch. The world watches. However, there is a suffering that overcomes. And the suffering that we endure for Christ with his power overcomes our sinful nature. And it is also a witness to the power of God and the genuine article of faith which you possess. See, the suffering that overcomes is a righteous suffering. And one of the greatest things that we can hold on to is that when we suffer, we have to understand that it is our sinful nature that is suffering. When we go through trials and testings and tribulations and persecutions, it will not be that our spiritual man suffers per se, but it will always be our flesh that suffers. Oh, they said this to me and it made me feel that. They did this to me and then now I'm like that. That is our sinful nature. Mind, emotions, my physical body. But inside, your spiritual man has no place to go but up. Even through the worst situations, you might be getting broken down physically. You might be having a hard time mentally. You might be depleted emotionally. Your spiritual man's just getting stronger through it all. The Lord has strengthened you day after day after day. He's raising you up day after day after day. You're learning how to push through bad thoughts. I never used to know how to do that. Oh, now I have these feelings and I don't feel like I can go. And now I push through my feelings. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That means overcoming thoughts, overcoming feelings, overcoming persecutions, overcoming tribulations, overcoming the desire to just quit and go in the opposite direction. All of a sudden now, now it clicks. Here, I'm doing what God's called me to do. This isn't make believe. This isn't play church. This is what God's word says. And so, when we hold on to those things, when we truly understand that as I am getting broken down, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, this is hard. Lord, I hate this. I don't want this, Lord. And then all of a sudden you start looking through the scriptures and James says, let patience have its perfect work that you might be complete, lacking nothing. And all of a sudden you start to have your eyes open to what is in the spiritual. You go past how you feel. You go past what you think. And there the Lord begins to reveal himself to you in a way that you never knew was possible. You grow. You become that man, that woman, that God has created you to be because you didn't quit. You didn't lean on your own understandings or your own feelings. You committed yourself to he who judges righteously. You committed yourself to the one who said, you can be confident of this very thing, that the work which I've begun in you, I'm faithful to complete. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, therefore, Paul writes, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Any difficulty associated with his faith, anything that was meant to snuff that light out, anything that was meant to trip him up, he says, I take pleasure in those things, for when I am weak, then I am strong. How can you say that? How can you truly say that? Paul was able to truly say that because he lived it. He was able to be weak physically, to be bombarded mentally, to be drained emotionally, and find that even in his physical weakness, his sinful nature as it was suffering, he was strong in Christ. And in the weakness of your sinful nature, you'll find that you're spiritually strong in the Lord. In the weakness of Garrett, I find that I'm spiritually strong in Jesus. But suffering in our flesh leads us to cease from sin. 
How does that work, you might ask? Well, that's a great question. But when you're denying the lusts of the flesh, it's painful. Man, I just want to smack that guy in the face right now. And I'm not going to do it. Oh, I want to give that person a piece of my mind right now. But I'm biting my tongue. I want to lose myself right now. I don't care what happens. We're going nuclear on this on three, two, and then I, you don't. Self-control. Oh, my goodness. This trial is so painful. How long, oh, Lord? And as you resist the lusts of the flesh, you find that, guess what? Ready to have your mind blown? If you resist the lusts of the flesh and don't give in to sin, guess what? You're not sinning. You're not sinning. Here it is set before you, two choices. One choice, give in to the lust of the flesh, feel good about it. Choice number two, obey the Lord and suffer in your flesh. If I choose to obey the Lord and say no to my sinful desires, then I'm suffering in my flesh, but I'm also ceasing from sinning. And it's real pain. No, you don't like it. But if you're suffering in your flesh and you're relying upon the Lord and you're holding fast your faith, guess what? You're ceasing from disobedience. Twenty-four. that those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's a rhetorical question for you. Do you think being crucified feels good? No, it does not. I've crucified the flesh. And as your flesh, your sinful nature is suffering, your spiritual life is thriving. And often, we can't see that happening because it's a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we rely so much upon physical senses to discern spiritual things, but they are incapable of discerning spiritual things. Because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And so I'm asking as we close today, that you would ask the Lord for wisdom to discern things spiritually. No more flying off the the handle. No, No more just off the cuff. No more making it up as you go. But that you would say, Lord, I need wisdom. If I can see this in the physical realm, there is something spiritual behind it. And Lord, if I am going to serve you well and to wage good warfare, if I'm going to arm myself with the mind of Christ, Lord, I pray that you would help me to do so, so that I might conquer. And then you'll find that instead of allowing your flesh to rule, your spirit rules. And so if you're going through it as a follower of Jesus today, Take heart that God is working a mighty work in your life. If your sinful nature doesn't like it, then good. If the world doesn't like your faith, then that must mean you must have a real faith. Good. And as you walk through the fiery trials, Jesus is with you. As he leads you through the refiner's fire to the other side, you will find yourself worthy of, To bear the name Jesus. So hold fast. And you will see that the Lord is good. And he will work it out. And he will take care of it. You just keep trusting in him. Let's pray.